Welcome to Movie Oubliette, the film review podcast for movies that most people have mercifully forgotten. I'm Dan. And I'm Conrad. And in each episode, we drag a forsaken film out of the Oubliette. Discuss it and judge it to decide whether it should be set free. <laughs> or whether it should be thrown back and consigned to oblivion forever. <laughs> It's SDD, everyone, and welcome to Movie Oubliette, episode 135, Ooh. the continental-spanning movie review podcast with me, Dan, actually reading a book down here in Melbourne, Australia. And me, Conrad, melting slightly in Cambridge, UK. <laughs> In this podcast, we discuss overlooked genre films, sci-fi, horror, and fantasy, because aliens with British accents just make sense, right? <laughs> Hello, Conrad. Everything with British accents made sense. Hello, Dan. Yes. How are you today? Oh, I'm wilting here, because in the UK, for some reason, we've decided to have uh, a 33 degree heat in September. Oof. I don't know who voted on this, yeah. but it doesn't please me particularly. It's awful. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that in Australian standards isn't hot, hot, but but in terms yeah. of the UK in September, that that's, yeah, unprecedented. It is, yeah. We're usually sort of knocking around 18, 19, 20 this time of year. Yeah. And we thought we'd gotten away with it because we had the 40 degree record breaker last year. Yeah. Um, we thought we'd gotten away with it because it's, it's just been wet and miserable throughout August. Right, um, right. And, but all of a sudden in September, we're having a heat, little mini heat wave and it's very unpleasant. So. Oh, wow. Apologies if you can hear my air conditioning in the yeah. back of, <laughs> background of it's this It's necessary. I can understand that. <laughs> yes. So you're actually reading a book again, Dan. Well, I uh, I think we've mentioned it before, but I am reading Dune. Uh, oh. Um, yeah. Because we might might cover the the original Dune movie on the podcast. Mm. Maybe, maybe, maybe. Um, but yes, also uh, I want to watch a new Dune movie. Uh, I, mm. I did hear that the part two has now been pushed back. It's now coming out next year. So I've got more time to finish the book. You do, yeah. <laughs> it's been pushed back to Easter, I think, or the summer. I can't remember because mm. obviously if Timothée Chalamet can't do his quirky internet interviews on YouTube, oh, of course. then they don't care. You know, there's, yeah. there's no movie. Yeah, if yeah. Timothée Chalamet can't do the friendship game <laughs> with another member of the Dune cast on YouTube. Uh -huh. So, uh -huh. yeah. yeah, yeah, game yeah. over. <laughs> uh, anyway, Conrad, anything in our mailbag today? We do. Uh, we have two new patrons this month. Uh, one of them is Antonio and the other is Jasmine. Hello. Welcome aboard. Hello. Yes, yes. Welcome. Jasmine wrote to us and said... Glad to finally become a Patreon member. It's been a long time coming. Ah. I've been working my way through the entire back catalogue since Iconicon 2022 and Whoa. finally got through it all a few months back. Wow. I initially only intended to listen to the episodes <laughs> featuring movies I'd seen, but changed my mind when I realised there were less than 20 films you'd reviewed that I'd not watched. Uh -huh. So I just committed to the whole enchilada. Really great stuff. I appreciate the hours of entertainment you've provided covering so many movies. Wow. Well, I, I, I appreciate your dedication to listening to, what, 134 episodes? That's <laughs> yeah. amazing. Well done. It is. Yes, especially well done for getting through the early ones because, boy, we weren't very good back then. Ah, <laughs> it's, it's documentation. It, it shows our progress, <laughs> our evolution. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's one way of looking at it. We also heard from regular listener Beach Boy Nick, who was referring to Troll and the band family ah. and all of their connections. So the director, the composer, and also 
the lead singer of The Calling. He said, interesting info about Troll and the band family at the beginning of this episode. I play in a covers band down in Devon and we play The Callings wherever you will go at every gig. It always goes down well and gets people singing along. I knew the singer was called Alex Band, but would never have imagined there was any link to the band filmmaking family. Uh At our next gig next weekend, I'm now going to be thinking of this fact when I play this song and trying my best not to sing wherever you may troll at the chorus. (laughs) (laughs) I think you should do it, Nick. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, you should do it. Yes, yes. Uh, and it's just like a, a, a special call out to anybody in the crowd who understands what you're doing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. At least once. Just one of the choruses. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and we heard from Serge of Cold Crash Pictures. Hello, Serge. Hello, Serge. And he said, The Fourth Man is the first Dutch Verhoeven film I've ever seen. And apparently I'm starting off on a high note because this is a fantastic fucked up little film. Oh, yes. Which would be considered especially bold and brash, even if it were released today, much less Mm. 40 years ago. The DVD's been out of print for 20 years, so you may have to resort to pirating to actually see it or pay $100 for a preview rental copy of the Anchor Bay box set, like a nut job, stroke me, but (laughs) it's well worth it, if only to follow along with this week's episode of Movie Oubliette. And uh, when I posted a particular picture from the film, see if you can imagine which one it was, Dan, uh, Serge said, and if you think Jesus in a Speedo is distasteful, don't worry, He's not in it for long. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Wow. Again, very much appreciate your dedication, Serge. Yeah, well, I'm actually jealous of that box set because it's got all of Verhoeven's early work in uh, his native oh, right. Netherlands on, uh-huh. in there. So, yeah, if we ever want to do any more of those, Serge Ooh. is the person <laughs> to go to. Okay, okay. Yeah. But thanks for writing in, everyone. We always love hearing from you. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, Conrad, it's time. It's time to reveal the movie for today. Yes. Let me just scamper on over to the oubliette to find out what it is. Oh, Oh, it's a bathroom in here covered with red fungus on the walls. Oh, okay. I don't know what's happened in here. It stinks. Oh, Oh. there's a guy on the throne clutching a DVD. I think he's dead. Oh, maybe he's not dead. Something going on in there. I'm grabbing the film and coming back. Well, same shit, different day. How's the stench? (laughs) Oh, honestly. (laughs) It was like me after black bean sauce. Oh, okay. (laughs) Too much information. (laughs) Maybe a little. So, what (laughs) do we have today? Okay, I have Dreamcatcher, a 2003 American science fiction horror film based on a book by none other than Stephen King, Mm -hmm. directed by Lawrence Kasdan, the writer of Raiders of the Lost Ark and The Empire Strikes Back, or one of the writers, Uh and co-written by Kasdan and Oscar-winning screenwriter William Goldman, the man behind The Princess Bride and Misery, one of the best Stephen King adaptations, starring Morgan Freeman, Thomas Jane, Jason Lee, Damian Lewis, Timothy Oliphant, Tom Sizemore, and Donnie Wahlberg. I mean, it's incredible the pedigree that's involved in this film, Dan. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And what happens in it? Well, best buds since childhood, Jonesy, Beaver, Pete and Henry, go on their annual hunting retreat in, where else, Maine, after Mm -hmm. Jonesy suffers a near-fatal car accident. But the psychic foursome find themselves in the middle of an alien invasion after they take in a man they find wandering in the snow who has a curious red fungal infection and farts that could strip paint off the walls. (laughs) One horrifying butt-destroying bathroom seen later, Beaver has been killed by a monster they call a shit weasel, Mm -hmm. 
And Jonesy <laughs> is possessed by an alien entity that speaks in a clipped British accent and is determined to spread its spore beyond the snowy wilderness and into civilization. Ooh. Pete and Henry give chase, but realise they need the assistance of their childhood friend Duddits, a mentally challenged cancer patient with supernatural powers who might just be an alien himself, <laughs> because they not only have an alien invasion to contend with, they also have Morgan Freeman's wild-eyebrowed colonel whose off-the-books military operation is hell-bent on wiping out every living thing in the quarantine zone. Mm -hmm. Just to be safe. Are you struggling to tie all the threads of this ragged <laughs> dream catcher together, Dan? That's because it's basically four films fighting against each other in a bag. But does that result in four times the goodness? Find out after the break. <laughs> yes, yes. And I have read the book, so let's get into it. Mm. And we're back to talk about Dreamcatcher, a book that I believe it took you a while to read, Dan. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. I started this book on the first year that we started the podcast, 2018, I believe. Uh, so it's been wow. like five years. I did finish it earlier this year. Mm. But yes, it's taken me that long because I don't read books normally. Mm. I am very slow. It takes me a while <laughs> to get into books. And, and also I tend to not finish books that are more than like maybe three, 400 pages. I'm keen on thin books. But this, yeah, it's a pretty hefty novel, Dreamcatcher. It's like, I think it's like six, seven hundred pages. It is, yeah, it's a big one. And the movie tries, but the book is not amazing in itself. Like, it is, like you said, <laughs> four <laughs> books joined together. You've got Stand By Me, and then you've got the horror shit weasel scenes, and then you've got aliens, and you've also got psychic telepathic powers <laughs> as well on top of all of this and the infection it's just so much going on in the book it was quite ambiguous as well mm. the difference between the virus which is the uh, sort of mossy growth that seems to grow on everything and on people and the shit weasels which are these kind of lamprey eel like ferocious teeth covered yeah snake like <laughs> things and then you've got the aliens which are they call them gray boys and they're just like your sort of stereotypical slender humanoid like gray alien with big buggy eyes yeah and in the book i could be wrong but i'm sure they were three separate entities they were kind of joined together telepathically but they were three different organisms in the movie they're kind of all one organism. I don't know. I cannot follow what their life cycle is. Yeah. I thought you got infected with the fungus, then you gave birth to a shit weasel. But then the shit weasels lay eggs that other shit weasels come out of, so they don't need the fungus. And then what are the grey boys? Are they grown-up shit weasels? Well... Because they just look like angry penises on legs. Yeah. I mean, yeah. It, it, it's, <laughs> it's an interesting design. So mm. I think in the sort of behind the scenes, they talk about the grey boys having two forms. They've got the grey boy A, which is the alien stereotypical, like, X-Files alien. Yeah. And then you've got grey boy B, which is like just a giant shit weasel <laughs> with legs. Yeah. It looks like a giant giant sperm slash penis that opens up like a vagina. So it's like phallic and vaginal at the <laughs> yeah, same <it> time, <laughs> which is very strange. Yes, big vagina with teeth lining yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. It's all very Freudian and Giga-esque in, in that aspect. Yeah. In terms of its psychosexual implications. Oh, yes, yes, yes. And the grey boy aspect of it is not actually how it looks. It's how we perceive it. Yeah, it's like a projection. Because it presents itself in a way that makes you feel 
say for. Yeah. But then when Jonesy encounters a grey boy, it explodes in a puff of fungus. Mm. So he's infected with the fungus. But that's not to give birth to a ship weasel. That's the whole possession mechanism. So this life cycle, this ecology just completely makes no sense to me whatsoever. I, I cannot mean, figure it out. In in the book, in the source material, it doesn't really make sense either. Right. So Jonesy gets infected with the grey boy, which has exploded, <laughs> his his head has exploded into the fungus virus. They also call it Ripley, the Ripley virus, yeah. sort of a reference to Alien. Also, sort of the chest burster, it's kind of a reference, it's more of an ass burster, I guess, in this movie. <laughs> and yeah, so Jonesy gets infected. But in the book, it's very confusing because he's possessed by the grey boy, but he's not covered in the red shit. No. It's almost like, I think they talk about it like Ghost in the Machine. So it's like the soul of the grey boy has infected Jonesy and taken over his mental control. So he controls Jonesy like a puppet. uh, And Jonesy's kind of relegated to this tiny room, his metaphorical room in his mind where he's safe from Mr. Grey, he calls him. But in the book, it is quite strange because it's not, he's not physically infected. He's just kind of mentally infected by Mr. Grey and controlled by Mr. Grey. Um, also in the book, he doesn't develop a weird British accent. I don't know who <laughs> thought that was a good idea or who thought that was going to be scary because it's not scary. No. When you sound like Malcolm McDowell, it's just silly yeah so that's damien lewis he'd just been in band of brothers right he was amazing in that so this was something that he picked and he's a british man and i don't know whether he or kazdan thought it'd be a good idea to differentiate the characters by speaking in his native british accent yeah he says he's doing an impression of malcolm mcdowell to me it sounds like basil faulty Right, yeah. I don't know what you think you're doing, mister. <laughs> you know, it's John Cleese all the way. It's Whatever it is, it is not menacing in the slightest. It is no. comical throughout. It is, yeah. I do not understand the alien plot at all. It has to be said, this is the first book written after King's hit-and-run accident in 1999. Mm. And during his recuperation, he wrote it longhand, over a six and a half month period because he couldn't sit at a desk with a typewriter or a word processor. Yeah. And he was under the influence of OxyContin. Right. In retrospect, he says, you can kind of tell. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. You know, in the last movie that we did, The Fourth Man, you could tell that Paul Verhoeven is having fun. You know, he's like laughing. He's got these little in-jokes in the movie with, with Jesus and the Speedo and that sort of thing. Yeah. This... It's just farting. This movie's just a big (laughs) fart joke. (laughs) Well, the idea was that King was penetrating the last sacred place where horror cannot go. I think when he was interviewed in 1983, he said that there are three things that are off limits as a horror writer, something that's unintentionally funny, certain forms of sadism, and anything to do with the excretory functions. Right. And then for Dreamcatcher, he said that he suddenly thought that the bathroom would be the great place to set a horror because as a man of a certain age, Mm. you suddenly realise that some of your most horrifying moments happen when you spot something. (laughs) Right. (laughs) While you're in the bathroom. (laughs) Sure, sure. Particularly things in the toilet bowl. But the trouble is, is that as soon as you've got people farting, it's funny. It is funny. It's scary. I mean, it was funny in the book, though. Like, it's it's ridiculous. You've got people just Mm. farting. And and the way it's described as well, the smell, (laughs) is like (laughs) on another level of putrid. Yeah. So, uh, I don't know. So, you have all of that. And then, as you say, you also have the Stand By Me flashbacks, which are mainly there to support the backstory of our main quartet of bro friends, Mm -hmm. guys Mm -hmm. who go hunting together Mm -hmm. every year. It's an impressive ensemble cast. I actually really like Jason Lee and Timothy Oliphant. Yeah, Jason Lee, Timothy Oliphant are standouts, I do believe, and they really embody those characters. Mm. They depict them exactly how I imagine them from reading the book. Mm. But they are also the first characters to die. So then you're left with Damien Lewis, who I think is not 
great in this movie. I don't think his acting is good at all. I think he would agree with you. Yeah, obviously <laughs> the British part is ridiculous, but even his normal acting just felt very B grade in this movie. Yeah. I'm not sure he could get a handle on it. Uh, He says, watching the film is, um, quote, nothing that a hand-rolled spliff can't help you with. (laughs) Yeah. So, yeah, that's his view. (laughs) Yeah, I I thought he was very miscast. Like, he didn't really embody Jonesy, the character, to me. Like, Jonesy in the book is a very interesting character. And Henry, played by Thomas Jane, who wasn't too bad. He's fairly bland. I think he's better in The Mist as a father. Right, yeah. Another key adaptation. I thought that worked quite well, the Frank Darabont movie. Yeah. I think the most miscast, in my opinion, is Morgan Freeman. Oh, God, yes. As a villain. (laughs) As a villain, I just can't... It just doesn't compute. It's like Tom Hanks is a villain. It just doesn't make sense. Like, you can't have such a lovable actor playing the villain that's supposed to be unhinged, shooting people in the foot or on the hand in this movie, Mm. wanting to slaughter all of these people in, in this sort of quarantine camp. It just doesn't make any sense. Why is Morgan Freeman in this role? I guess they were just casting against type for a bit of fun. It's stunt casting. Yeah. But... I mean, Morgan Freeman can be so many things, even the voice of God. Yeah. He cannot be a jarhead who comes out with things like, you know, let's not get all girly about this bucko. I can think of many wonderful actors that could do this kind of thing in his sleep. Morgan Freeman is not one (laughs) of them. I know, I know. And the eyebrows. (laughs) Yeah, the eyebrows, especially when they're sort of dusted with the snow as well it's like (laughs) you are not scary that villains don't have dusted eyebrows What about Donnie Wahlberg as the adult version of Duddits? I mean, it's a very small role. He's barely in the movie. Mm. Yeah, I, I don't know. It's fine. The ending, we'll get into it later, but the ending is horrendous. Very different from the book. Very, very different. Mm. But I did find the portrayal of Duddits as a child a little bit cringy. Yeah. It, it almost seems offensive. Yeah, I think the casting is problematic in retrospect because yeah. in the book doesn't he have down syndrome yeah he does he does now you could easily find there are many really great actors with down syndrome mm. so yeah it having somebody who clearly doesn't have any, not yeah it's yeah. awkward although that kid actually i think is the best of the bunch in the kid scenes because i'm sorry the kid acting in the flashback scenes yeah is bloody awful no yeah i would agree stand by me this ain't (laughs) yeah it's not and it feels very disconnected from the adult versions of the characters as well there doesn't seem to be much connection at all like they try but yeah it feels like another movie yeah just jammed in there i think kaz dan is the problem right and the reason i come to that conclusion is because I know that William Goldman understands the difficulties of adapting a book, something we talked about with Vincenzo Mm. Natale, oddly enough, in the previous episode, Mm. that you have to capture the essence of the book, the important themes, rather than the specific events that happen, and try to distill that into a three-act movie structure. And Goldman gets that. One of his books, he goes through the process of adapting the Clint Eastwood thriller absolute power Uh and the novel for that it just keeps introducing more and more characters and more and more subplots and he starts listing them out as he's working through the book to figure out who is the main character Mm. and what is the main story thread here right so he walks you through that process and tells you how he arrived at the finished movie which is not a bad movie okay not a classic by any means but it's a fine movie and you know goldman can do this because he did it with misery a fine king adaptation and then you find out on Dreamcatcher, Kazdan rewrote Goldman's script to put back in elements that 
Goldman had taken out. Right. So I think Goldman picked one of the four movies. Interesting. And made that. And I think Kazdan has come back and jammed the rest of the book back in there. Yeah. And the result is this unholy mess. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. Interesting. I did find the first hour of the movie pretty solid it's not bad it's not yeah. terrible like you know some of the acting is a bit ropey but it's pretty solid and in terms of a depiction of the book it's pretty beat for beat which is i found quite surprising like how much they've covered in terms of the source material in the first hour mm. the remainder of the movie is not the book at all it's just some other thing like uh, the ending <laughs> is what what i don't know I don't know who who was responsible for turning Duddits into an alien mm. because he is not an alien in the book at all. No. There is way more emphasis on the sort of psychic superpower, telepathy and mind battles. So the ending in the book, they actually go into the mind of Jonesy and they battle the, the alien. Well, actually the alien is on a deathbed in hospital and they strangle the figurative alien in his mind. Mm. And that's how they defeat Mr. Grey. And it's really surreal. There's a lot more sort of trickery and manipulation with Mr. Grey trying to get Jonesy out of the Tracker Brothers office sanctuary away from Mr. Grey. Uh, he turns the office into like a different room. At one point he tries to turn the heat up in the office to try to get him to leave the room. Mm. So there's a lot more sort of weird mind sort of Dr. Sleep type battles or manipulation. Yeah. Which they don't show in this movie at all. He's just stuck in this office and he's looking out this window and Mr. Gray's doing his thing. Yeah. I can understand why he struggled with that. I mean, Kazdan said in 2003, quote, there are a lot of fever dreams in the novel. That was part of the difficulty of the adaptation. A lot of things take place in people's heads. Yeah. He's trying to find ways of visualising that. Yeah. Now, interesting, I, I can imagine there are a number of directors who could turn that into compelling mind fuckery yeah. on screen, something that's conceptually just fascinating mm. to watch. You know, somebody like Alex Garland thinking about the sure. ending of Annihilation. Sure. But the trouble is it wouldn't be a popcorn munching butts on seats, yeah. multi-million dollar crowd pleaser. Mm. But mm. even in this movie, you have what appears to be the sort of big budget, high glossy production climax like an hour into the movie with the military taking on the crashed alien spaceship and yeah. dozens of aliens running around. You have that big, explosive, violent, epic outdoor finale in this snowy landscape. Mm. And then the real finale of the movie to try and externalise all of that mental battle into something you can physically see happens in some sort of water treatment shed yeah. between two guys, a dead dog and, and a big penis alien. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the most surprising thing is when Duddits comes in and turns into an alien and it's just some sort of weird, like, alien melding body horror weird transformation with terrible CGI and then everything just kind of puffs into, like, red dust. And <laughs> I don't know. I don't know how that was the right choice for this movie. There's also the original ending mm. on the DVD, which is very anticlimactic. Uh, I think Duddits comes in and he does the weird finger thing where he wiggles his finger and shoots like this telekinetic beam or something <laughs> at the alien and he gets flung against the wall and turns to like grey goo, which is also terrible. Both endings terrible yeah <laughs> i don't neither <laughs> one is good neither one is good in terms of the whole in your mind conceptual weirdness maybe people just weren't ready for that mm. in you know 2003 like you've seen a lot of that now with dr sleep and i think the show's called legion mm. so maybe i don't know i guess 2003 audiences weren't quite ready for that sort of weird concept yeah i guess not or at least it was not something that a big movie studio was ready to sign off on yeah. back then yeah I mean, Kazdan had never directed a big special effects movie. He'd written them, but he'd never directed one. Mm -hmm. So he'd written Empire Strikes Back and 
Raiders of the Lost Ark. He'd never directed anything like that. He'd done westerns and he'd done ensemble dramas. Yeah. Yeah. Which means that the four friends aspect of this, he's pretty good at. It's not bad. It very much feels like the big chill. Yeah. 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 It's not bad. That that scene with the four in, in the cabin just, you know, talking shit and like drinking and, and laughing. That's great. That's really great. But once they start killing off the characters, all the characters kind of being separated. I, I don't know. There, there was a lot of exposition Mm -hmm. just being told to us by one character just talking to themselves (laughs) yes or a dead body (laughs) yeah yeah the peak character (laughs) talks to himself and it explains duddits for us Mm -hmm. like i think duddits is an alien like okay (laughs) i guess he's an alien now (laughs) and then you've got you know henry talking about other things and jonesy talking about his memory library or whatever it's called the memory warehouse um, and explaining that i get it the book has a lot of explaining to do and in the book you don't have to have a character literally talk to you explaining things you just hear what they're thinking because that's how books work yeah you can't hear how characters think in movies no you always have to externalize it some way but yeah yeah, having pete talk to a dead body for six pages is not deft yeah exposition especially when most of that is obvious and at the end of the movie you've got that interminable section where tom sizemore is driving Thomas Jane and Donnie Wahlberg, so the Duddits and Henry character. And Duddits is just sort of eking out through his leukemia-riddled pain yeah. the odd word or two. And Thomas Jane explains everything that he's meant by that and his thought yeah. process after having heard that yeah. and what they need to do next. There's this lengthy car ride yeah. of him just explaining the whole plot to Tom Sizemore. <laughs> yeah. It's painful. And yet at the same time, there are numerous places in the film where people just seem to know things or accept things without us seeing it being explained to them or i thought that too one of the worst examples of that is where the owens character to help henry escape from the military camp he just busts through a wall in a humvee (laughs) and he says you could have run me over and he says well i figured you were psychic so you'd just get out of the way well when did he tell him he was psychic yeah i know i know he never told him that yeah the whole sort of psychic telepathic power stuff they've only just kind of glaze over in this movie they don't really it's it's something that is very prominent in the book Mm. very important in the book because in the book anyone that has the virus infection the the red mossy stuff anyone that is infected with that has telepathic powers oh so in the book that's how kurt in the book i think it's curtis in this movie morgan freeman's character that's how he tracks henry and owen through the telepathy because one of them i can't remember who is infected with the virus yeah they can sense them yeah. and and in the movie they don't talk about that at all people are just infected and they say oh you know some people recover and some people get the shit weasel and <laughs> we don't know why uh, but uh, it's that's how it is and i mean in the book that's exactly how it is as well right so there's a lot of ambiguity about who lives and who dies because it's just like uh, i don't know that some people do i did feel with how much they've included in the movie from the book if someone didn't read the book would they even understand this movie because there are a lot of scenes that i thought they did not explain that at all no like (laughs) it's baffling (laughs) yeah i was trying to sketch it through see i've read the book because i read all of king's books yeah well Not so much now. I've tended to shift over to his son, Joe Hill, who I think is better. But um, (laughs) I did used to read all of his books religiously. So I read this, but I read this like 20 years ago. Uh So I Uh I don't remember it terribly well. So I was trying to imagine what it must be like for somebody watching this movie for the first time. And, you know, you're introduced to the four friends who are psychic That's great. It's interesting the way it's introduced. Mm. Then you're introduced to the memory warehouse when they're talking to each other, which is this mental abstraction of how Jonesy organises his mind. Yes. Then there's a flashback, and now we're watching a movie that's like Stand By Me. Then you get the whole 
bathroom thing yeah. and the fungus. And after you've got that and the shit weasel, then he turns around and comes face to face with a large alien. <laughs> yes. And then it explodes. Yeah. I'm just sitting there thinking, just as somebody in 2003 sitting in a movie theatre, it's like, what the, <laughs> what the hell? And now here comes Morgan Freeman as a jarhead that's shooting people. Yeah. Yeah. Too many yeah. concepts just piled on each other. Mm, and some mm. of them, as we've said, get this interminable <laughs> amount of exposition and other things just accepted on faith with no yeah. questioning whatsoever. Like uh-huh. even the kids in the flashbacks, when did they realise that Duddits had supernatural powers? Because they seem to know it before they embark upon a quest to find this missing girl. Yeah. And then they also seem to have supernatural powers themselves, but it's never quite explained why that happened or mm. how they felt about that. Yeah. It's just taken on faith. Yes. So it's like all these massive conceptual leaps and it's just all piled on top of the audience, mm. even mm. in nearly two hours and 20 minutes. It's just too much. Yeah, I think the adaptation of the book would have been better as a show, as a TV show, Mm. to really focus on those beats of the book, but really explain it. Mm. Each concept in the book could be its own movie. It doesn't deserve it, though. This is not Prime King at all. This is Recycled King. Yeah. Stand By Me and The Shining and The Tommyknockers and The Stand. It's a whole host of stuff. It's just a guy hopped up on pain meds, scrawling his greatest hits over 600 pages. Yeah. I don't think there's an original idea here that's worth hanging a whole narrative onto. I mean, I have to say, uh, I think the sort of structure, uh, the plot structure and and sort of pacing of the book was quite hard to sort of get on board as well because you've got Mm. the two main horror scenes, the bathroom scene and also the scene where the shit weasel eggs hatch and you've got all these tiny little worms crawling across the bed um, and Henry lights everything on fire. Those are the two main horror scenes in the book and they happen like before halfway Mm -hmm. and you've already killed off two characters as well. So you've only got two more characters for the rest of the book. And most of that is either just trudging through snow or a really long car chase that goes for seeming, I think it does actually go for like three days where they're just (laughs) driving through snow for three days. There are other things in the book that they don't have in the movie. There is a revolt at the quarantine camp. So in order for Henry to get out of the camp, he uses his telepathic powers and gets everyone in the camp really riled up. Uh-huh. Um, and then they get all like pumped up with um, energy and, and go and attack a bunch of guards. And, and it's, it's a yeah, pretty intense scene. Everyone, lots of killing and people just shooting everyone. It's, it's insane. They miss that. There's also a, a scene where in order for Jonesy to sort of um, delay... Mr. Grey, who's taken over his body, he um, he lures him with the idea of bacon being a really enticing flavor because oh, he's yes. an alien. He doesn't know about human, you know, <laughs> senses. And, and so he goes to a diner <laughs> and he makes him order like a bacon sandwich. And he just like eats wa- way too much bacon. And then he just shits himself in the, and <laughs> spends like, <laughs> like half an hour in the bathroom just like shitting himself. It's really funny. Um, but they, you know. Didn't put that in the movie. <laughs> also, a lot more brutal killings as well. Uh, Mr. Gray in the body of Jonesy. I, the, the truck driver, he kills him by taking over his mind and, like, stabbing himself with a pen in the eye, which Ooh. is, like, horrifying. Mm. And then the police, I think the police officer, he, like, slams his head into a wall. It's it's a lot more violent, um, the killings. In the movie, he just turns into a giant penis teeth monster and <laughs> bites people's heads off. I don't know. <laughs> uh, it's, yeah, different. 
I guess they were going for the whole creature feature angle, I guess. I don't know. Yeah, so they're trying to do the whole big alien invasion movie. It is. But it's very derivative. I mean, they mention Ripley in the movie, but you've got the red weed from War of the Worlds. Uh, You've got the immolation of the alien nest in the cabin, which is aliens. Mm -hmm, Again, mm -hmm. none of it's particularly innovative or interesting. And... I couldn't follow the rules. Yeah. I couldn't figure out who was capable of doing what. Like, oh, the aliens can telepathically broadcast to everybody to say that they're safe and there's no problem here. They can do that now. Yeah. And now one of the characters has the ability of wayfinding with his finger. Yeah. Then at the end of the original version of the ending of the movie... Duddits used that to fire a laser or something and it's a different (laughs) thing. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> so what are the rules? Because I need yeah. rules. Yeah. It's like Henry talks to Jonesy on a phone while talking into a gun. Yeah. Did we know they could do this? I know. Because they've never done it before. That's what I was saying. Like, I don't think someone who hasn't read the book would understand what the fuck was going on in this movie. Yeah. Because things just happen <laughs> and you just have to accept it. <laughs> <laughs> Now it's time for Random Trivia! So Dan, what fabulous piece of trivia did you discover in the snow covered in red fungus today? Yes, so this trivia is actually uh, a detail in the book that you don't see in the movie. Huh. So I think we, a lot of us do know that Stephen King's books are all set in the same world. So the Dreamcatcher book is set in the same town, I think, or uh, mentions the same town as it. Because in the mm, book... Derry, um, yeah. Yeah, Derry, Maine. So in the book, uh, at one point, Jonesy, possessed by Mr. Grey, tries to go to a, a water facility or a standpipe, as they call it. It's not a term I really know in Australia. Um, but instead of finding the standpipe, they find a plaque and it reads, To those lost in the storm, May 31st, 1985. And to the children... All the children. Love from Bill, Ben, Bev, Eddie, Richie, Stan, Mike. The Losers Club. So those are all characters from It. Mm. uh, And also spray painted across the plaque in jagged red letters. It reads, Pennywise Lives. Oh. And I, I mean, I've I've read a few Stephen King books, not a huge amount, but uh, like at least like four or five books. Um, and I've never come across this sort of universe, Stephen King universe before. So it was, it was quite nice to read that. Yeah, there's a lot more of it, certainly later on in life, and particularly his Dark Tower books, ah, which right. are fantasy books and deal with... Uh, crossing over from one dimension to another and different worlds. Yeah, there's a lot of uh, paths crossed and characters appearing in different ah, guises. Interesting, interesting. And a suggestion that that there's this, like the series Castle Rock, right, which suggests that there's this king universe ah. that everybody is inhabiting. It's fascinating stuff. Yeah, yeah. and that's our trivia. Yes. Yes. So this is Lawrence Kasdan's first attempt at directing a big action movie. Mm. How do you think he fared? Oh, terrible. (laughs) (laughs) Not good at all. Not good at all. I mean, in saying that, they do that with all the Marvel movies. They, They get all these sort of indie, like, drama directors to direct huge blockbuster Marvel films. And it seems to work sometimes, or half the time i think that's because they cheat because i think all of the action scenes they are either 90 percent or 100 percent an animated computer graphic cartoon yeah yeah and i think they're heavily storyboarded and executed by somebody else Mm. so i think you've got great indie director that directed this low budget drama with three people in it doing the scenes where people talk to each other Mm. And meanwhile, there's a bunch of people storyboarding these massive, stupid action scenes. Like that 
Black yeah. Widow movie that was bloody awful. Yeah, and yeah, then they yeah. you know hive it off to the lowest bidder on all of these CGI farms with all these underpaid people that are slaving away for twenty four yeah. hours a day trying to get this stuff done. Mm, mm. The effects on this movie are by ILM. Ah, are they? And this is back in the time when. They're really trying to figure out which techniques to use on every single shot to make it work and to tell the story and to have the effect that they want it to have. I mean, yeah, definitely back then that it was still predominantly practical in terms of you're inserting a little bit of CGI in a mostly practical in-camera scene, hmm. as opposed to now where you've got hardly any in-camera, just pretty much actors on the ground and everything else is cgi yeah so it's a different way of making movies it is yeah and then it means that when there is a cgi shot they've put a lot of effort into it i mean i actually think the shit weasels look pretty good in the cgi scenes i do too early on in the movie yeah i think the finale is clearly brushed oh they were biting way too much you know you've got a full body alien weird thing and then the battle with the two aliens, it's destined for failure. In 2003, <laughs> it's mm. too much. Yeah. I don't know. I, I think the whole movie felt very cobbled together. There were just like a lot of scenes just back to back that I guess there were, you know, beats from the book, but it felt very emotionless. Mm. Like I didn't really care about these characters so much. Could have been because of the bad flashback acting. I don't know. There's something really cold about the movie like there was no warmth at all even with duddits i don't know yeah it could have been really heart-wrenching the whole duddit stuff yeah i think it's because it's too fast there's just too much going on yeah that's and true. there's not enough time to build investment in the characters but even the direction and in particular, I was comparing this to the fourth man, the integration between the inner and the outer worlds. So Jonesy locked in his internal memory fortress, his mm. warehouse, and he's watching what's going on outside the window of this room. There aren't clever transitions between one and the other. It's just like he's watching a movie that's being projected on a flat screen. Yeah. And also, in the second half of the movie, it just resorts to wipes. Did you notice that? Yeah, Star Wars wipes. <laughs> Star Wars wipes. <laughs> First hour of the movie, none. Then all of a sudden, we're wiping yeah. all the yeah. bloody time. <laughs> 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 yeah, talking about, yeah, the, the sort of integration of the mind world and the real world mm. could have done sort of things like I'm um, thinking of the ritual, you know, in the scenes in the ritual where you have like the actual bed in the forest. Like he could have been just yeah. there with like half of the office just in the middle of the snow. That could have been really interesting. That was so disturbing. There's such a fantastic shot where he's finding half of the convenience store yeah. in the woods. In the ritual, yeah, yeah. Or an American werewolf in London where he's in a hospital bed in the middle of the forest. Yeah, it's you could easily do something like that that would have brought this concept alive visually and conceptually in your mind. But no. Mm. I also found the memory library warehouse. Um, it's, I don't know. I, in the book, I imagined it being a, like a vast warehouse, very fluorescent lit, very sort of sterile, just a whole bunch of boxes on shelves. But this is like this dusty, kind of cute, dinky library with a spiral staircase. I don't know. It just didn't have the same feeling of like, these are all his memories, you know? Yeah. I mean, it's a handsome production. It should be said, it looks like $70 million. It does look expensive. Yeah. I mean, in terms of the setting, it's great. The snow, it's just, it's an amazing bleak setting mm. for an alien invasion. Yeah. It's filmed in British Columbia, so they were freezing cold, lots of night shoots. And also real steam coming out of people's mm. mouths. Like, because I don't see that anymore. I can always tell it. Yes, that's definitely CGI steam. They're not actually cold. But you've got... <laughs> you know, you've got real steam, which is nice. It is nice, yeah. And real snow a lot of the time, although well, sometimes they've still got polystyrene stuck in their fake eyebrows. Oh, yes. <laughs> it's one of my bugbears, <laughs> fake snow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You'd think yeah, we would have mastered yeah. the snow that melts when it hits people by now, but no. <laughs> okay, score. Yes. What'd you think? Frequent collaborator James Newton Howard. Uh -huh. He's done a lot of these sort of 
big movies, probably most famously now for all of the Hunger Games movies. Right. But right, round right. about the mid to late 90s, he just shifted gears into becoming more of a an action composer. He'd done a lot of dramas, but he'd shifted into action. So he'd done things mm-hmm. like The Fugitive right. and developed a new synthesized percussive plus orchestra sound yeah. for the 90s. In this one, he was particularly asked by the director, I believe to make it much more sound designy and less thematic. Uh-huh. So a quote from Kazdan, I didn't want it to be a clear distinction between sound effects and music. Right. I think from the get-go, it's as bland as hell. Yeah. I didn't mind it, actually. I preferred all the synthy stuff. It's kind of a lot of glassy, um, mm. sort of eerie tones. I, I didn't mind that. I mean, it, it does sound very early 2000s like it It does does, it does date a little all the other sort of big like horror things and horn blasts and like strings i thought they were very cheesy very generic it's not subtle is it no there are occasions where the jonesy mr gray character appears and james newton howard is just making the whole orchestra play the same note as loudly as they possibly can it's just bang bang and he's just putting his hood up or something yeah it's really bad but i think it's trying to make a scene work i think that's what Mm. kazan's trying to do like it's not a horrifying scene and he's (laughs) trying to spoon feed the tone i guess with music he's trying to fix the scene with music and it yeah it doesn't work at all yeah i think you're right and i think you know you're on a bad path at the beginning of the movie where you see sort of the blandest late 90s opening title and it's accompanied by this glassy plinky plonky thing with this crunchy drum loop underneath it and it goes nowhere it's not engaging the images aren't intriguing either and you've got three minutes of that before the movie starts now i love a great opening title scene i sometimes miss them in modern movies Mm. but when you do it and you do miss the opportunity to set a tone or tell a story I think it's a real shame. Yeah, I didn't mind that, actually. No? I, I, again, it, it's this sort of synthy, glassy stuff. And it does come back throughout the film. It is, even though they, they say it's not thematic, it does come across as a bit thematic. Mm. You do hear it a few times. So, I don't know. I, I found all the other string orchestral stuff a bit cheesy. Yeah. And I wanted more of the weird, eerie synth okay interesting yeah Yeah, i was more compelled when you think that james newton howard also composed the score to signs for m night Shyamalan. yeah and that is an amazing score yeah thematically in terms of themes meaning certain things and then combining to mean other things in the finale and Mm. that is a clever score a lot of his work for m night Shyamalan when he could afford him yeah he can't anymore so he does have the chops he does have the ability, but maybe... He's a fantastic yeah. composer. Yeah, maybe Kazdan's the problem here. I think Kazdan's the problem. <laughs> it did derail his career. He didn't direct another movie for almost 10 years mm. after Dreamcatcher. Bombed at the box office. It was released in March of 2023 with a budget of $68 million. It got a total box office of 81 worldwide, Oof. which is not enough. No. It debuted at two, held off the number one spot by Steve Martin and Queen Latifah's comedy, Bringing Down the House. (laughs) Of course. (laughs) And disappeared about four weeks later. It finished 87th in the overall box office for the year, in a year when Finding Nemo, Pirates of the Caribbean, the second Matrix movie, and the final Lord of the Rings movie dominated the box office in the US. Wow. So, yeah. Yeah. Didn't do well. Yeah. Well... We all know why, don't we? I think we do. (laughs) (laughs) Coming to you live from the Movie Oubliette Theatre, it's the prestigious Mobley Awards. Hello, it's that special time of the pod, the Moobly Awards, where we nominate our favourite butt-blasting parts of the film in a number (laughs) of alien-devouring categories. Best quote. I don't have a favourite quote per se, but I have a favourite line delivery, which comes from Timothy Oliphant. Uh It's one line delivery. It's when he's doing that whole eight pages of exposition to a dead body in the snow scene. And he's halfway through talking about duddits and he says 
I should be singing his praises, not questioning which galaxy. I gotta pee. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> he just switches mid drunken yeah. storytelling to yeah. I gotta pee. Yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> And I love it. When nature I want to give Timothy Oliphant a <laughs> hug just for that line delivery. Yeah. Uh, I mean, Beaver, in the book, Beaver has the best ridiculous lines like fuck a rouse and, and um, Jesus Christ bananas. And <laughs> <laughs> it's just great. Love it. Uh, he also says a line that I really like, kiss my bender, which is just great. <laughs> fuck me, Freddie. It's, it's just all these like one liners are just like, oh, it's, it's 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 wonderful it's wonderful and, mm. and jason lee delivers he really does yeah best hair or costume i think there's a clear winner for hair and costume it's for facial hair and for a different category than we've ever had before it's eyebrows oh <laughs> yes it's morgan freeman's wild eyebrows with his flat topped haircut all grey of course yeah all of it's Freeman's idea apparently the eyebrows oh okay and Kazdan said yes but uh, it's certainly the most distinctive thing in the movie yes 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 <laughs> most <laughs> naughty moment well it's not technically naughties, but it's when Jonesy is talking about his memory warehouse <laughs> and he said he had he had to throw away the memories of rock and roll lyrics in place of the memories of him trying to work out his laptop and it shows like his, his memory warehouse he puts the box back on, on on the shelf and it says apple g3 laptop how the damn thing works and the, the apple g3 <laughs> laptop came out in 1997 right uh, yeah but very popular in the early aughts yes 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 i can imagine mm. yeah naughties for you for me, the most naughtiest thing in this movie is definitely the shock running over of a main character in one continuous oh, shot. Oh, yes. Because yes. it felt like we just discovered that digital doubles are really cool, so yeah. we're going to do it all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I think it started in 98 with Brad Pitt in Meet Joe Black, where he was hit by a taxi and a van. Ah, but right. we were all about running people over in the same sort of shot to sort of show, oh, look what we can do with computers now. Yeah. We can run people over in the same shot. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> favourite scene! My favourite scene, I imagine it might be yours too, it's the bathroom scene. Mm -hmm. Because as well as being genuinely horrifying and disgusting, it's also hilariously funny. Although I do question why... Beave is so addicted to cocktail sticks in his mouth that he sacrifices his life in order to get one. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it does happen in the book as well. Exa pretty much exactly the same. Exactly the same. Mm. Um, and he, uh, he is obsessed with always having a toothpick in his mouth. I don't know why. It's just mm. his thing. It's just his thing. Uh, I really like that scene as well. Another key scene is, is the other shit weasel scene in the bedroom where um henry discovers the shit weasel with the eggs and then he shoots the shit weasel and then the eggs hatch and you've got all these disgusting leachy worm things coming towards him henry sprays <laughs> them with the lighter fluid and sets the whole whole bedroom and cabin alight and it's this fiery inferno it's it's uh, it's a striking scene also when he first goes into the cabin everything is covered in this red virus mm. infection moss stuff and you can see it spreading on the dream catcher and other surfaces it's it's a it's an amazing scene to look at yeah most cliche moment special needs kids are special <laughs> yeah yeah i know especially in the 90s as well they're always like mathematicians or like you know yeah <laughs> savants in some uh, capacity yeah yeah your neurodiversity is like the deus ex machina at the end of the movie or you're, you're an alien <laughs> you're an alien <laughs> yeah it's just oh this is i can sort of feel where they're trying to go with it in terms yeah. of they think that this is really progressive and great that you know even special needs kids are special mm, but mm. i mean they shouldn't be supernatural or aliens <laughs> I mean, well no. 
I'm not sure that's helpful, really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Best special effect! My favourite special effect is the first appearance of the shit weasel. Yeah. Just because it's that fascinating POV shot from Beaver's perspective. His glasses have come off and you get this shot of this out of focus thing wiggling up the door frame and then he the glasses come into view mm. and then it comes into focus and you actually see it in its full glory and all of its teeth open yeah yeah the, the shit weasels sort of initial appearance of them really great like just the movement mm. of them sort of slithering across the floor as well like quite unnerving to watch yeah, and it's really well integrated into the scene. There's a mm. shadow on the floor yeah. and the contrast looks good. I, I believe that it's there. It looks scary. And I think some of it, when you look at the behind the scenes, I think some of it was practical. Yeah, they were fighting puppets. with real puppets. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Favourite sound effect. I quite liked, even though it, it kind of doesn't make any sense, but the alien head exploding sound, um, it's kind of got a very eerie... Almost like a like a mushroom puffball sound, like a pff, pff sort of sound. I quite like that. It wasn't what I expected. Mm. Yeah, that's a good one. It's uh, yeah, it's sort of shocking in terms of it being underwhelming almost, yeah. which makes it creepy yeah. and disturbing. Like it yeah. doesn't have a, a wet, squelchy sound to it. It has a very dry, sort of eerie, I don't know. Like a um, breathy mm. sound. Mm. Yeah, like it has a personality. Mm. Mm. Sound for you. I don't have a favourite sound in this film because I'm overwhelmed by my loathing for the worst sound effect in the film. Oh, yes. Which is one that I've mentioned at least twice on this podcast before. It's a stock sound effect. I think I first mentioned it on Dragon Slayer. Oh. And it's that... <laughs> Sort of, I'll, I'll give it to you so you can put it in yeah. the episode. <laughs> That's a good uh, impression, though. It's that fucking sound effect, and I hate it. And it, especially when it's used to pump up something that is not scary. And it's used whenever Jonesy pulls his hood up because he's going to turn into a, a massive sperm penis. Yes. <laughs> so every time he pulls his hood up, it goes... And it's like, don't do that. It's fucking cheesy as shit. Mm, mm. Most funniest moment. I think the moment the film suddenly nose dives is Jonesy zooming out of a shed on a snowmobile after he's been possessed and coming to rest in front of the camera and sliding a woolly hat on and then snapping his head to the right and pulling the goofiest <laughs> grin whilst James Newton Howard hits everything in the orchestra at once. I think it's supposed to be scary. I burst into hysterics and at that point my investment in the movie was gone. <laughs> yeah, just purely because it's not scary. It's no. it's like it's like showing a cute puppy and putting the most dramatic horror sting ever. It just doesn't make any sense. <laughs> and that's our movie. Hi, this is Vincenzo Natali. I'm the director of Cube and Splice, and you're listening to Movie Oubliette. Okay, it's time for our final verdicts. Should Lawrence Kasdan's adaptation of Stephen King's Dreamcatcher be deliberated to infect the world with its virus and be praised for its world domination, or should it be defeated in a gruesome, weird, alien transformation fight and its red, dusty remains be swept back into the oubliette, never to be witnessed again? Conrad, Dreamcatcher. What do you think? No. <laughs> That's what I think. <laughs> I've I've tried to make excuses for this movie. I kind of liked the book when I read it 20 years ago because I yeah. sort of liked everything King did. Yeah. But, I mean, in retrospect, 20 years later, it's not a good movie. I don't think Kazdan's fit for this sort of material. Mm. I think he screwed up Goldman's script. I think possibly Goldman had done a better job. There's too many movies. Mm. None of them are executed particularly well except for the first hour with the friends in the cabin but after that it just as we've said it just goes straight downhill it's enjoyable maybe as unintentionally funny mm. 
in places. It's a bit of a mess. It's kind of a morbid curiosity, but I, I just couldn't recommend it to people. Yeah. I really couldn't. There are better movies out there, many of which are lampooned viciously in this movie. So, yeah, watch those instead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, definitely not. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, I spent, what, four or five years reading the book. Um, I don't think the book's amazing, as well i don't mm. think it's a masterpiece i think yeah it's too many books in one book um <laughs> and the movie is too many movies in one movie it is quite interesting though to watch a movie so badly adapted from a book <laughs> like it's quite interesting for me like to uh, to know all the things that happen in the book and to see a lot of it realized on film and a lot of it mm. not explained. Like, from, it's quite <laughs> interesting. Like, I don't know how someone not reading the book would understand the movie at all. There's so no. much in there. Uh, yeah, I don't know. It was enjoyable for me just, just how badly something was adapted. But yeah, it was very badly adapted. I would not <laughs> recommend this movie to anyone. But if you want to see a... Some pretty funny and horrifying moments. Yeah, I, yeah. Why not watch this movie? But it's yeah, <laughs> the ending is atrocious. The ending is is. I have no idea who okayed the ending. Not good. Not good at all. No. Um, but yeah, don't don't watch this movie. But do if you've read the book. <laughs> just just to see how how badly things can get. <laughs> how yeah. bad it turned out. <laughs> <laughs> Well, let's find out from our patrons what they yeah. thought of the movie, too. I mean, I think it's a pretty dead cert going back in the oubliette at this point. But let's see what they had to say. <laughs> Hello, Hal. Yes, Conrad. Time for the patrons' vote, please. Shockingly, our patrons were undecided. It was a tie. Oh, equal. Mm, yeah. Interesting. Wow. Yeah. It's proven divisive. I would not have guessed that. Yeah. So Eddie Coulter says, can't believe I'm saying this, but let the shit weasels free upon the world, <laughs> but be sure to wear your iron undies when you do. There's some movies that just have to be seen to be believed, and Dreamcatcher is one of those movies. I still can't get over the people involved in front of and behind the camera. Whoa. Yeah, <laughs> right. Interesting. Mm. Uh, whereas our new patron Jasmine said, For several years, I was an avid reader of Stephen King, getting every novel as it came out, until Dreamcatcher stopped me dead in 2001. <laughs> as it is a gruesome mix of gore and downright awful plodding storytelling, mm. the film is the worst King film adaptation of the worst King novel, a <laughs> title I previously gave to the Tommyknockers. Maybe King should just stay away from writing stories about aliens, right. since I also found Under the Dome to be nearly unreadable. Throw this raw sewage back into the oubliette. <laughs> oh, very well said. Mm. And Surge of Cold Crash Pictures said, I saw this in theatres as a budding 14-year-old cinephile and it immediately became one of the worst movie-going experiences <laughs> of my short life. Oh, my God. <laughs> Oh, no. And finally, Chazilla. Only Stephen King could write an oxy fueled alien pooping nightmare like this. <laughs> Good friends, fart jokes, alien invasion, and Morgan Freeman. What's not to love? Well. I say take a break from SSDD, stock up on Tums, pick up Donnie D, and give Dreamcatcher a watch. Mm, okay. <laughs> yeah. I think it's a no, though, isn't it? Yeah, Dad? it's a no. It's a no. All right. Yeah. Back in. Okay. No, no. Back in you go. Yes. Mm. Well, that was interesting. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so uh, what is going to be up next on uh, the podcast? What's in our next episode? Well, our next episode will be a patron's choice movie. So we should spin the wheel to find out which one we're going to have okay. out of the ones they've okay. nominated, Dan. So we got a great list of nominated films from our patrons, all the way from 1933's Dracula's Daughter, mm -hmm. which should be fascinating, Pontypool, 
The Hidden, Phantom of the Paradise, Magic, Solomon Kane, Funny Man, The Caller, Dolls from the Empire box set, The Wizard of mm. Speed and Time, and Freddy as FRO7, a British animated movie. <laughs> ah, okay. Let's spin the wheel. Okay. <laughs> okay. Ooh. Oh, Amazing that's going to land on. That's spinning. Oh, oh, Solomon Kane. Oh, okay. I have seen this movie. It's a 2009 action adventure film based on the pulp magazine character of the same name, created in 1928 by Robert E. Howard, <laughs> directed by M.J. Bassett, and starring James Purefoy, Max von Sydow, Rachel Hurdwood and Pete Postlethwaite. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have seen this. Who nominated this one? It was Anthony. Oh, okay. A fantasy horror based on a character from the creator of Conan. Uh Uh Aha, aha. Never seen it. One of those rare moments where I've seen something and you haven't. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) Which means you'll be doing the synopsis. (laughs) 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 Okay. And uh, if you want to stay up to date with our future episodes, you can follow us uh, as Movie Oubliette everywhere on our socials and uh, email us at movie.oubliette at gmail.com. Yes, and if you want to support the show, head on over to Patreon, where for as little as a dollar you can nominate films like all of our patrons did for our next episode. For five dollars, you get access to our exclusive monthly minisodes and get to vote on the final verdict. And for ten dollars, you can be an executive producer and get exclusive behind the scenes information like our current executive producers, Chazilla, Eddie Coulter, Isaac Sutton, Dr. Doggy and Surge of Cold Crash Pictures. Mm -hmm. We had a lot of bonus material from our last episode with uh, Vincenzo Natale Mm. on The Fourth Man. A lot of tangents we uh, went on. Yes, lots of chats with him, including I got a chance to ask him about his Westworld episode starring Anthony Hopkins and what that was like. Mm. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, We have merchandise as well on Redbubble and a YouTube channel, uh, with a lot of live panels we were involved with, and video essays. Mm, check those out. Yes. All right, listeners, thanks again for joining us on another episode. Uh, have a butt blasting time. See you next time. <laughs> <laughs> Bye for now. <laughs> Alright Pete, I'll bite your bag and everything else.